All right, let's get started. Um, again, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our semi-annual update on the status of the Daniels Fine Gold versus MBTA settlement agreement and uh, accessibility at the MBTA more broadly. I am Laura Brailsford, and I will be your virtual MC this evening. Next slide. First, I just want everyone to know that we are very grateful. We have two Spanish interpreters joining us tonight, Daniela Corvide and Kendall Castaño. Uh, we are offering interpretation during the entire meeting. Uh, to access the interpretation in your meeting controls, click on the interpretation icon, which is the small globe icon and check the Spanish language option. Daniela, would you mind introducing yourself and sharing that information, please? Hola a todos. Soy Daniela Caride, una de las intérpretes de español hoy, y estamos ofreciendo interpretación en español esta noche durante esta reunión. Entonces, para escoger el audio en inglés o en español, usted tiene que escoger el botón de interpretación que tiene una imagen del mundo abajo en el menú. Después, por favor, escoja el idioma en que le gustaría oír la interpretación. Muchas gracias. Thanks so much, Daniela. All right, next slide. All right, this is where I put you all officially on notice that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, the MBTA may choose to retain and or distribute the video, still images, audio, and transcript from this meeting. By continuing attendance with this virtual public meeting, you consent to participate in this recorded event. If you are not comfortable being recorded, please turn off your camera and keep your micro microphone muted or you may choose to excuse yourself from the meeting at any point. Uh, just a couple other, other uh, notes for those that uh, rely on keyboard commands. Uh, just a reminder that if you use the Alt-Y commands, it will raise your virtual hands. We'll talk more about that in a little while. If you press Alt-H, it will take you to the chat box. Alt A will toggle your audio off or on, and Alt B will toggle your video off or on. Uh, your microphone and webcam were automatically disabled upon entering this meeting. Uh, when we get to the feedback portion of the meeting, uh, you will have the option to ask questions, and at that point, we will take your microphones off mute. Next slide. All right, I am also really pleased to uh, be joined by Denise Martinez and Kat Devar, who are providing ASL interpretation for us this evening. <clears throat> they should be automatically spotlit on your screen. However, if that is not happening to view, to view their videos, uh, find the interpreter's video within the gallery mode located in the top right portion of your screen. Uh, in the top right corner of their individual uh, window, click on the ellipses, and then click on the quote pin video option. This will keep the interpreter's video on your screen throughout the whole meeting. Uh, as, the, as the interpreters switch throughout the meeting, you can follow the same steps to pin the other interpreter. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, I also want to welcome Denise Garcia, who is providing part captioning for us this evening. To start viewing the closed captioning, you can click on closed caption 
with the CC icon at the bottom of your screen on the right side. Uh, you can also, uh, if you're interested, click and drag the captioning window to put it on any portion of your screen. Uh, one other great feature is that you can adjust the captioning size by clicking the upward arrow next to the start video uh, uh, icon and then click on video settings, then accessibility. And within that menu, you can move the slider to adjust the caption size. Next slide. All right, and uh, given that this is a virtual meeting, no doubt there will be technical questions that come up now and again. If you run into any challenges or have any questions, please uh, reach out to us using the chat feature. Uh, we have somebody on hand to help with uh, any any tech issues. Um, we will work to work with you to troubleshoot any issues that pop up. Next slide. <clears throat> All right. And at the start of every public meeting, we want to remind folks of the MBTA's commitment to diversity and civil rights. Uh, specifically, all MBT activities, including public meetings, are free of discrimination. The MBTA complies with all federal and state federal laws, civil rights requirements, preventing discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, disability, limited English, English proficiency, and additional protected characteristics. We welcome the diversity from across our entire service area. If at any point you have any questions or concerns, please visit mbta.com slash title six. And title six is spelled title uh, VI to reach the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. Next slide. All right, uh, moving on to our agenda for this evening. Uh, we have a great one for you tonight. Uh, very shortly, uh, Phil Ng, our general manager, is going to share some updates yeah. with you all, including some, some priorities he is focused on. Uh, Judge King will then be giving his semi-annual report out on the status of the settlement agreement. We're then going to hear directly from representatives from the plaintiffs and our tag uh, sharing with us their perspective on uh, a number of accessibility priorities. Uh, and then I will be introducing uh, our new chief operating officer, Brian Colin. Uh, and then we'll be hearing uh, about the development of a new, uh, new municipal communication and coordination plan. And finally, we will be leaving plenty of time for feedback and Q&A at the end of the meeting. Okay, so next slide. Without further ado, Catherine, you can actually take down the slides here because without further ado, I want to introduce our general manager, Filling, who's going to share a few words with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Laura, and thank you, everybody. Um, it has been several months since the last status update of the settlement, and a lot has been happening at the T. Uh, but I do want to be able to have this opportunity to share a little bit of that. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity here. Uh, since the beginning, you know, the focus has been obviously on safe, reliable, robust service and bringing it back to the levels of service that everyone deserves. Um, and we've made some organizational changes that I think are very instrumental as we continue to rebuild our system and our infrastructure. And some of those folks um, are going to be very vital to this group because for instance, Sam Zhao, who is our chief engineer and in charge of capital program delivery, uh, and Dennis Farley, our chief of stations, two key senior leadership hires that have come from transportation backgrounds, but also very focused on improving how we deliver projects, how we deliver projects that are accessible and to ensure that we're serving all of our customers and all the communities that we are um, 
within and joining. Uh, one of the things that they're looking at is how to improve project delivery, how to improve and ensure that these projects incorporate the right elements and then we deliver them more timely. And looking at our design standards with a focus on the public, the user, and the key part component and priority of that was improving accessibility across our system. I know I hope to have the opportunity to introduce them um, at some future meetings. I know Dennis Farley has been able to join us here tonight. Um, so that is an important component because Dennis has been visiting all of our stations, all of the facilities, and really focus on not only the environment, the cleanliness, but looking at the accessibility needs and going to be working hand in hand with, the, with Sam Zhao as we look to improve designs moving forward in the future. Another key person who will be speaking later, Ryan Kaholan, Chief Operating Officer, um, somebody who has um, shown his ability to deliver, having worked with the T on the commuter rail side. Uh, now he takes on the larger role of Chief Operating Officer across all of our modes of travel and obviously accessibility and how he supports the T in terms of public service is going to be vital. But I'm glad that Ryan has a chance to be able to talk a little bit more with everyone here uh, directly. And then some of the other things is just how do we improve the system, getting our system running back to where the public deserves and that they know the system is safe. And that's something that we'll focus on. Uh, they've actually been very successful with starting to restore our track infrastructure and doing it in a way that we haven't done before because we're looking to accelerate that work and accomplish a lot of years of disinvestment and tackle that in and complete it by the end of 2024, eliminating a lot of the publicly known and discussed speed restrictions that have impacted so many people's lives. Part of that also, and I, I had the opportunity to last month participate and thank you for the invitation by our tag uh, and the plaintiffs to join the strategic planning session last month which I know we'll be talking a little bit more later, but during that uh, presentation and other presentations where I talked with the group about the need for diversions is how do we ensure that when we have alternative service, uh, particularly buses, that those locations that we choose are accessible, that the operators are trained and that the buses and the alternative service that we provide is um, available to everybody that needs it. Uh, those are things that the team is very focused on uh, to make sure that as we accomplish work, that we're not losing sight of the goal. And that's making sure that we serve all of the people that want to use and need to use our system. Uh, so with that, I just close with know that you have my commitment. You have my commitment of my senior leadership. Uh, and you know that the workforce that are going to be delivering on all of these uh, needs and priorities are going to be um, supported from the top on down to make sure that we do fulfill our commitments and that we don't lose sight of all the good work and hard efforts that have gone on to date within this group and working closely hand in hand um, with the plaintiffs. So with that, I'll turn it back over, um, but thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this session tonight. Thank you so much, Jim. All right, next up is we have Judge King who will be sharing his semi-annual report on the status of the settlement agreement. Judge, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, General Manager Ng, uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, let me just take a moment to uh, uh, explain my role and how I got involved uh, with this uh, litigation. So in 19, uh, rather than 2006, uh, as part of the settlement agreement, uh, I was appointed by the federal district court as the independent monitor to oversee compliance with the settlement agreement. The agreement provides for these uh, semi-annual public uh, meetings. I believe this is our 33rd uh, public meeting. The purpose of, of the meeting is to uh, hear from me with regard to my findings concerning the MBTA's compliance with the settlement agreement uh, and to give you an opportunity to learn about some new developments uh, taking place with regard to accessibility and to provide the community with feedback so we hear from the community with regard to how well you think the T is doing with regard to accessibility. 
So today's meeting will last uh, two hours. Uh, the first hour you'll hear from me and from uh, uh, some team managers. And then the second hour will be devoted to hearing from uh, the community with regard to any questions that you may have. And uh, there are representatives of the T here who will be able to answer your questions. Uh, this will be our eighth uh, public meeting conducted by Zoom, and I want to thank uh, the dedicated uh, T employees and interpreters who are working so hard to make this uh, 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 event such a success. The 2006 settlement agreement uh, obligated the NDTA to make uh, over 200 uh, improvements. In December of 2018, the plaintiffs and the T signed an amended settlement agreement that listed 46 items that remain to be completed uh, under the original agreement. The amended settlement agreement sets forth the timetable for completing the remaining 46 terms, as well as for certain additional accessibility commitments that the T agreed that were not part of the original settlement agreement. Since the amended settlement agreement was signed, it has completed with uh, 33 of the 46 terms, leaving uh, 13 terms to be completed. While some of the terms, once completed, require no further action, such as phasing out the high flow buses, most of the uh, items uh, that are found to be uh, compliant, uh, have a, there's an on, ongoing obligation by the T to assure that they remain compliant. And I continue to monitor the uh, T's compliance with those provisions to make sure that there's no slippage. After the MBTA completes its obligations under the, uh, the admitted settlement agreement, uh, it will be the responsibility of the Riders Transportation Access Group, so-called RTAG, uh, to take over ongoing uh, oversight of the MBTA's uh, accessibility performance. By the way, RTAG will be having a meeting uh, on Thursday of next week, uh, December 14th at 5.30, and I urge uh, all members of the disability community to attend that meeting and to get involved with our tag if you're able to. I realize that some of the people uh, listening to this uh, meeting today uh, are, are users of the ride and probably have had problems with the ride. Because the ride is not part of the uh, settlement agreement, we will not be discussing the ride during this presentation this evening. If you are having questions about the ride, you should contact uh, SWA directly about it. There are three provisions of the settlement agreement that have proved crucial, crucial in the progress that the T has made under the settlement agreement. The first is the creation of the position of Assistant General Manager for Accessibility filled by Laura Brelsford. The second is the creation of the Department of System-Wide Accessibility and the third is the creation of the internal monitoring program. Under the internal monitoring program, teams of observers and testers travel the system and report back on how well the MBTA is doing when it comes to meeting its uh, accessibility uh, goals, including everything from reporting on the quality of stop announcements to the quality of securements of uh, wheel mobility devices. Glenda Campbell is now responsible for overseeing the internal monitoring program and has been doing a very good job providing detailed reports concerning uh, past and pre uh, present performance so we can see how well the T is doing and where the uh, trouble spots are. Uh, with a few exceptions, the reports provided to me and the plaintiffs uh, by the monitoring program reflect a high degree of compliance with the requirements of the uh, amended settlement agreement. Of course, in a system with thousands of employees, some employees' performance will at times fall below expectations. But the key is to make sure that when an employee fails to make a stop announcement, passes by a customer waiting for a bus stop, fails to secure a wheel mobility device properly, or fails to meet any other obligation regarding accessibility, that the MBA takes prompt action to investigate any claim violations of policy and to take corrective action, uh, including imposing discipline when appropriate. In addition to the monitoring program, program, customers can report problems through a variety of means from Twitter to calling the 
617-22-3200 number. During the third quarter of this year, there were 191 accessibility complaints received from uh, customers directly. SWOE and team managers now have a very good system in place to keep track of accessibility complaints and to conduct a prompt investigation. Uh, during the third quarter of this year, 98% of the complaints were responded to and, take, and action taken, including uh, suspensions and retraining where employees were found to be at fault. By comparison, uh, back in 2015, only 75% of the, only 75 of complaints were promptly investigated. So we've seen a very significant improvement uh, in the T's ability to uh, monitor and, and uh, investigate the complaints that come in. The internal monitoring program, however, can only do so much because of the size of the program compared to the thousands of bus and train trips taken every day. So it's very important that members of the public, people listening to this presentation this evening, report any problems you encounter. If you experience any accessibility related problems with the MBTA, please report it by calling the 617-222-3200 number. If you do, please be sure to provide sufficient information so the employee in question can be identified. By that, I mean, for example, date and time of day, bus route, employee number, and bus or train number. There are cameras throughout the system, so if sufficient information is furnished to management, uh, management will be able to conduct a prompt investigation, and we avoid the situations involving a he said, she said, where the employee says one thing and the uh, customer says something different and there's no way to determine which side is accurate. Now with all the cameras throughout the system, uh, generally there's no problem in figuring out exactly what happened and uh, determining whether or not an employee was at fault. The following are a few examples of information contained in the bus monitoring report for the second quarter of uh, 2023. This is just a snapshot of some of the information. The report is very detailed and contains much more information about present and past performance. Now, 98.8% of the monitors were able to board their assigned fixed route buses successfully. Bus operators pull to the curb 97% of the time. Onboard stop announcements made both audibly and visually 97.4% of the time. External destination announcements, those are the announcements you hear before you step on the bus, were only audible 92.9% .9 of the time, suggesting that more attention at the circle check in the morning to these speakers is needed to identify defective speakers. Years ago, the uh, there problem with external uh, destination speakers was very, very bad, and as a result of work that he did, uh, they ended up replacing a lot of the speakers and in the past several years, the problem has largely been eliminated. But in recent reports, I've seen an increase in the uh, percentage of these speakers that apparently aren't working. So that's an area where more needs to be done. Operators fulfilled reasonable requests for assistance 91.37% uh, of the time. This typically involves uh, requests that the uh, a ramp for a ambulatory passenger be uh, lowered, or, or a passenger who may be have uh, sight limitations may be uh, asked to be notified when the stop is reached. Uh, there were about there were five failures to provide assistance during the past reporting period, and most of them involved situations where there was a failure by the driver to let the passenger know when their stop came up. The wheel mobility straps were uh, properly secured. That is all four straps, 88% of the time, which is an improvement over recent reports, but well below the 94% compliance rate uh, we experienced before the pandemic. Operators do need to do a better job employing the shoulder and seat belt lap belts. Operators only successfully uh, deploy the shoulder and seat lap belts 62.5% of the time. Uh, let me now address the bus signs. At our last uh, meeting in June, I discussed the problem uh, of all the missing bus signs in the system. 
Since then, the MHA has completed an audit of about 1,100 bus stops and determined that out of, uh, that's 1,100 out of the 7,600 bus stops that they have, they found that about 15% of the signs are missing. So if you extrapolate that throughout the whole uh, system, that means that there are probably in excess of 1,100 missing bus signs. In addition to that, you have bus signs that have the wrong information because of changes of route. And you also have buses signs that over time have faded and are difficult to read. So there are probably uh, thousands of uh, bus signs that need to be replaced. Now, T, the T has made a priority to address this problem. And over the next year, they plan on uh, replacing about 1,000, uh, about 900 signs, I believe. But obviously, uh, uh, that's probably not even half the number of signs that need to be replaced. So I'd urge the T to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, take this problem, make it a higher priority and devote more resources to uh, not only fixing the current uh, uh, problem, but also setting up a regular audit program. So periodically people go out and actually check to make sure the signs are there and that they're correct and that they are legible. Uh, next, I'd like to address elevators and escalators. In my last three reports, I mentioned that I was concerned about the uh, drop off and up time. Um, the T before COVID was running at like 99.5% uptime for elevators. But uh, recently, this dropped uh, to as low as 98.5%. Uh, Likewise, um, escalators have uh, dropped in performance below 95%. And the last year, they were elevators, so rather escalators that were out for months at a time. Um, so that while some improvements have been made since my last report, we've seen uh, elevator uptime at about 90 uh, uh, eight point, a little better than eight, I think ninety eight point five percent. But uh, more needs to be done to get the goal to the goal of uh, ninety five uh, or ninety eight point. Or I'm sorry, ninety five percent uptime. As you're aware, uh, a major challenge the T faces is keeping the elevators clean. A lot has been done over the last several years, and the problem has largely been reduced, but not eliminated. Um, the T tried a, uh, a pilot urine detection uh, program, and while they that that device did not prove uh, very good at detecting urine, it did uh, provide the uh, T with uh, valuable information about uh, certain stations that were having problems. The uh, ambassadors and the CSAs now check the um, the uh, elevators every hour and call in for cleaning if they find the elevators uh, uh, dirty. Um, the uh, most recent data we have shows that uh, the elevators are found to be dirty by the, uh, by the inspections uh, only 1.1% of the time. However, for some of the elevators, the, uh, uh, the, they are soiled much more frequently. For example, the 10 worst elevators have been found soiled between 4.6 to 8.1 percent of the time. Three of the worst elevators are at the Park Street station, with inspections showing the soil between 6.1 and 8.1 percent of the time. By soil, I mean they're being used as uh, as bathrooms. Uh, I think the next logical step that uh, for the T to take to resolve this problem is to assign an employee as an elevator attendant at the dozen or so of uh, the worst elevators with the hope that a result of constant uh, presence of an attendant, uh, whoever is uh, using the, the elevators as a bathroom will find a, a more appropriate place to relieve themselves. And perhaps over time, uh, they'll stop uh, this terrible behavior. Uh, now, with regard to the call center, I've mentioned uh, problems with the call center for several years now. And um, uh, I know work has been done to address that issue, and I'm hoping that at the next uh, meeting in June, I'll be able to give you an update uh, relative to how they're going to resolve that issue. Uh, I, let me now turn to the 13 outstanding commitments uh, uh, remaining to be uh, fulfilled. Today, I received from the MBTA uh, a compliance report 
listing uh, four additional terms which the T believes is now are now compliant. The plaintiffs will have 60 days to uh, respond to that uh, report, and then I'll issue my report within 30 days indicating whether I agree that those items can now be checked off. Um, let me first address the four items that are subject to the compliance report that I received today. Terms 86 and 88 require the MBTA to develop a marketing campaign on accessibility. The MBTA recently conducted a marketing campaign, um, and uh, from the preliminary information I received, it appears that it was quite successful. For example, before the marketing campaign, uh, the accessibility uh, section of the T's website would receive uh, about a thousand uh, hits a month. After the uh, marketing campaign, uh, the month following it, they had 8,000. So they went from 1,000 hits to 8,000, which is suggests that the marketing campaign was very successful. Uh, <clears throat> uh, term 44 and 71 of the uh, 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 minute settlement agreement obligates the MBTA to provide sufficient personnel uh, to provide access at all stations while they're open. As a result of increased funding and additional employees hired by block by block, the MBK now believes it has sufficient coverage to meet its obligations on the settlement agreement. So I will report back at the next meeting whether or not uh, I agree with the team that they have sufficient coverage. Uh, term 69 of the amended settlement agreement uh, uh, requires the MBTA to uh, create a new design guideline for accessibility to replace the last design guide that was uh, published about 33 years ago. Uh, and it's now uh, uh, much out of date. We expect the design guide to be, will be completed by the next by next spring. A lot of work is done. They're almost finished. Uh, <clears throat> next, I'd like to address alternative transportation. Uh, this relates to terms 73 and 77 of the amended settlement agreement, um, which requires that alternative transportation services uh, be provided for persons with disability, meeting all the requirements of the ADA. With all the construction taking place, uh, uh, there has been a huge increase in the amount of alternative transportation between stations, especially during the weekends. Because the MTA, MBTA lacks sufficient bus drivers to provide the service, it needs to rely on private contractors for alternative transportation services. At times, uh, these contractors lack sufficient resources and need to rely on out-of-state out bus companies to meet their needs. Often, the buses used by these vendors are coach-style buses with mechanical wheel mobility devices, device lifts that often do not work, or when they do work, at times, the operators don't know how to use the list. While the MBTA has done an excellent job in organizing alternative transportation when needed in providing private vendors with excellent curriculum for ADA training, the private vendors have not all been doing a satisfactory job training drivers and assuring their compliance with the ADA. Internal monitoring reports, as well as random inspections by MBTA officials have confirmed that more work it needs to be done to make sure that the private vendors fulfill their obligations. Uh, last month, the uh, general manager had two meetings with the uh, plaintiffs and others. And on November 20th, the general manager met with his staff and the plaintiffs and representatives of RTAG and Mass Senior Action to discuss the MBTA's plans for addressing this problem. Um, so the there's a lot going on to address the problem, and I'm hoping that when I report our next meeting in June, uh, I'll be able to report that there's been more progress in this area. Uh, term 12A of the amended settlement agreement requires uh, emergency preparedness for MBTA employees and third party providers. The MBTA is well on its way to complying with the term, this term, except for developing a training program for MBTA police. That has not yet occurred. Uh, term, 30, <clears throat> term 30 requires that stop announcements be reliably made on subway cars. The orange and blue line cars are doing very well. And there has been significant improvement on the red line cars. 
However, about 15% of the red line stop announcements are still not being made or are not being made loud enough so they could be heard. Um, until the new red line cars are uh, in service, which probably won't be for several years, I expect they will continue to experience uh, ongoing problems with the red line stop announcements. Uh, uh, term 20 of the amended settlement agreement requires the MBTA to reduce to writing its policy for notification to relevant agencies that propose service changes and to provide those agencies with the opportunity for input. Uh, this is still a work in progress. Uh, now, term 70 deals with uh, municipal coordination, and you'll be hearing uh, from uh, Angel Donahue Rodriguez uh, uh, during the program later, so I won't uh, mention anything more about that other than to say that SWA has circulated draft plan to the plaintiffs, and I'm hopeful that by uh, my uh, June meeting next year, I'll be able to report uh, progress with regard to this particular term. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to address downtown crossing and Park Street elevators. That deals with terms uh, 55 and 56 of the uh, settlement agreement and uh, requires the uh, that the elevators connect the red and orange lines at downtown crossing. A notice to proceed to construction is expected to be going out in the summer of uh, 2024. Although it will take several years to complete this construction, the MBTA will be considered in substantial compliance uh, with this term if construction contracts are executed and funded and notices to proceed or contracts have issued for all connections in a robust system of wayfinding and announcements is designed for implementation. And now in, in concluding my report, I'd like to thank the plaintiffs, uh, Bill Henning at BCIL, uh, GBLS attorney Tara Doucette uh, for their steadfast commitment uh, for more than 20 years in partnership with the UBJ to make the system accessible for everyone. Much thanks is also owed to Laura Brailsford and her amazing staff at SWA, as well as so many other MBTA employees who have done their very best to make the system accessible. I especially want to thank Jeff Garneval, who will be retiring in the spring for his outstanding work over many years to achieve the goals of the settlement agreement. Uh, I'll now turn the meeting over to Laura, who can introduce the next speakers. There we go. Judge, thank you very much. All right, Catherine, if we could get the slides back up. Thank you, Rob. Um, all right, next, as you heard Judge King mentions, uh, Judge, Judge King mentioned early in November, the named plaintiffs, as well as uh, the executive board of the Riders Transportation Access Group, came together in person for a strategic planning session. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, uh, introduce Joanne Daniels Feingold, the lead name plaintiff, uh, and our tag board member, and Nora Nagel one of the co-chairs from our tags executive board to report out on the work they've been engaged with over the last six months, as well as some outcomes of that strategic planning session. Next slide. Uh, but before I do that, uh, Joanne, I know is going to make uh, a statement specifically on behalf of the, the named plaintiffs before segueing into uh, the update from the last six months. Joanne, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. I'm Joanne Daniels Feingold, the first name plaintiff of the Daniels Feingold at our class action, action lawsuit. I'm also a member of the RTAG Executive Board. On behalf of the plaintiff group, I'm here to share with you our evaluation of our collaboration with the MBTA since Judge King's June meeting. 
The MBTA has been thoroughly scrutinized by local media with critical commentary regarding safety, decaying infrastructure, multiple green line issues and large gaps on the orange line. The plaintiffs agree that these problems create barriers to transportation for everyone, most particularly for people with disabilities. Where am I? Okay. The plaintiffs expected first that the new orange line trains with their gap mitigation system would help alleviate gap issues. However, the size of the horizontal and vertical gaps will take more effort to resolve. The plaintiffs are pleased that the MBTA has acknowledged the problem and begun to take action, measuring gaps in each orange line platform, working toward correcting these gaps. Alternative transportation. From the outset, alternative, the use of third party transportation has been problematic. Bus drivers and bus starters don't always know how to deploy intercity bus, bus uh, lifts. And the lifts aren't always in working order. Passengers using rollators, walkers, or canes, and passengers with hidden disabilities who are unable to use the steep stairs aren't offered the use of the lifts. Plaintiffs urge the MBTA to use in-house buses and drivers as much as possible because they're trained by SWA, they're, they're experienced in working with all passengers, particularly passengers with disabilities. The call center. The plaintiffs have raised seriously, serious, serious concerns with Judge King and SWA regarding the MBTA's call center. For years, it has been outsourced to third party vendors. The call center is key to properly reporting and recording passenger complaints and flagging those with a disability component. The third party vendors lack the understanding to do this critical work. Plaintiffs believe that the MBTA employees, unlike the private vendors, will have institutional knowledge of the system, direct access to T departments, and a vested interest in making the tea and its processes better. Um, I just wanted to mention too, you can make a complaint online on the tea uh, website. Uh, the municipal coordination plan, the plaintiffs are pleased that discussion and a draft plan for the MBTA to work with municipalities to prevent barriers, such as planters, bike racks and uh, trash cans in and around bus stops and to give notice of any construction near stops in coordination of snow removal. The marketing campaign. Um, you may have noticed over the last couple of months that our faces have been on the sides of buses and in stations. We uh, are really pleased that the Access in Motion marketing campaign has been well received showcasing the, not only the T's accessibility features, but also providing an educational component, component regarding people and disability. Um, now um, we're going into an update of activities that we've had with RTAG. The plaintiffs in RTAG, in the RTAG group are two separate and distinct entities working towards a common goal of transportation access. Over the years, the plaintiff's group has been working closely with RTAG. On November 2nd, named plaintiffs, the RTAG executive board and, and others who have met in person with SWA and the general manager. Our goals were to review the status of the settlement agreement and past progress, identify shared concerns facing older adults and riders with disabilities, and to develop, to develop plans for continuing to raise awareness regarding these concerns. Over the last six months, we provided feedback to SWA on five additional sections on the MBTA's design guides for access. We met as a group and reviewed, this, uh, as the plaintiffs met as a group and reviewed the five sections Together, our tag and the plaintiffs met with SWA and T leadership to provide our feedback. Our tag hosted listening session, sessions on platform gaps on the orange line and on snow and ice removal at bus stops and stations. 
RTAG submitted a letter to the Secretary of Transportation to request revisions to current bike lane guidelines in order to incorporate accessibility considerations. We all met with General Manager Eng to discuss concerns regarding accessibility during diversions. And we collaborated on the crea creation of this Access in Motion campaign. Uh, many who participated were named plaintiffs, plaintiffs' friends, and MBTA, MBTA employees and RTAG members. I'm going to turn this back over to Laura, who I believe will turn this over to Nora Nagel. Yes, if we could get the next slide up, please. And Nora, uh, again, Nora Nagel is one of our hard tag co-chairs. Nora, I will turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the strategic planning session specifically. Thank you, Laura. So my name is Nora Nagel. I'm one of the co-chairs of the executive board of RTAG. And as you've heard, we had a strategic planning meeting with the named plaintiffs in SWA in early November. And the purpose was to review the settlement agreement, to identify shared, uh, shared concerns. This is all just recapping what Joanne has already told you and to develop plans for continuing to raise awareness regarding these issues. Could I have the next slide, please? Some examples of the top accessibility concerns that were raised were um, one that came up and it's very seasonal, um, is a lack of reliable and safe access to bus stops throughout the system. And part of that has to do with municipal engagement with the maintenance of bus stops. Um, you can design and create a perfectly accessible bus stop, but when or impediments like illegally parked vehicles and bus stops, uh, inadequate or non-existent snow and ice removal in bus stops, or bike lanes that are literally in or directly adjacent to bus stops raise very serious safety concerns and make it impossible for riders to safely board or disembark buses under all throughout the entire system. Um, and we've been asking the MBTA to work and to coordinate with communities, municipalities, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to make sure that standards exist and that consistent compliance happens throughout the system to ensure that bus stops are accessible. Uh, as Joanne mentioned, the platform gaps on the orange line are a known problem and are being addressed. But one of the things that we think needs to happen is adequate staff training on the use of bridge plates to ensure safe and uh, safe access to orange line cars and appropriate training of transit ambassadors to be proactive on assisting riders who need assistance in avoiding these potentially incredibly dangerous gaps. Next slide, please. As Joanne also mentioned, accessibility of transportation during service diversions is a major issue. She mentioned the lack of um, training of staff on the third party buses. What we are asking is for the MBTA to prioritize using their own low floor buses over third parties with the understanding that at the present time, there is not sufficient staffing to do that, but making that a priority. Um, also for the MBTA to recognize that these diversions cause specific and greater barriers for visitors with dis or for riders with disabilities who, and I'm using myself as an example, I'm an accessible route learner. I learn my route. And if there is a if there is a diversion, finding a comparable workaround that is accessible is something that riders with disabilities need to be able to do 
And if it needs to be done on the fly, having these transit ambassadors be more proactive in engaging with riders as opposed to just waiting for somebody to ask them questions is something that we think is really important. Um, so adequate tran uh, transit ambassador availability and just being proactive with riders and actively seeking to provide assistance as opposed to only reacting to requests. And let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, and the, the availability of accessible real-time information on vehicles. Um, this is something that's more complicated. I don't know that any of us has a good answer to it, but understanding that real-time information that may be available to vehicle operators may not be available to the public. In other words, if operators are made aware of service outages, elevator outages, upcoming diversions, um, problems on the system, the MBTA needs to think about how their existing infrastructure like the overhead screens or their PA systems, as well as other methods could be leveraged to provide that information in real time to riders who may not, due to sensory disabilities, language barriers, may not have access to the information on those onboard screens or audio announcements. So those are some of the priorities that we've been talking about and that we talked about at that, that um, strategic planning session. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Laura. All right, Joanne, Nora, thank you so much. Um, I also just wanna take a second to thank both uh, the name plaintiff's group as well as our tag and all, all of our writers here tonight, um, the feedback and the uh, concerns you have shared with us over the years have helped us make set better priorities and make better decisions. Um, and largely the progress we've made has been thanks to our collaboration with you. So uh, we appreciate that that ongoing ongoing relationship. All right, next up, next slide. I just wanted to quickly highlight some uh, initiatives that have been underway over the last few months. You heard both the judge as well as uh, Joanne mentioned, a broad uh, marketing campaign that kicked off in early September called our Access in Motion campaign. <clears throat> the goal here was really threefold. First, to make sure that we were communicating the fact that accessibility at the MBTA and really everywhere benefits all of us, not just people with disabilities. Uh, we also wanted to communicate a number of key accessibility policies and features on our system. And thirdly, we wanted to share and raise awareness about the progress that's been made over the last 15 plus years. And also uh, the fact that we're committed to continuing to do more. And we've got a lot of great stuff in the pipeline. I so just wanted to show you two visuals if you haven't seen them. Um, so the first on the screen is an image of to uh, two uh, women at Park Street and the uh, the tech streets. Did you know in 10 years, one in five Boston area residents will be over 65. We're improving access, so it's there when you need it. MBTA.com slash accessibility. So we had a number of components of the campaign that were intended to just raise general awareness about disability and accessibility. And then next slide. Uh, like I mentioned, we also had a number of components that were designed to let people know about features or services that they may not be aware of. <clears throat> and this is a great example. We've got two individuals outside of the Park Street elevator. <clears throat> Uh, one of whom is seated in his wheelchair and another is 
looking over his shoulder at his cell phone. And the text on the side reads, did you know you can get elevator outage alerts sent to your phone or online by going to nbta.com slash elevators. Or you can call our elevator escalator hotline at 222 uh for mass relay. So uh, to see all of the components of, of the campaign, you can go to our website, mbta.com slash accessibility. Uh, I just wanted again to thank all of the, the uh, models and volunteers that worked on this with us, as well as our customer experience colleagues who helped pull this together. All right, and we uh, just recently, uh, put out our semi-annual semi report on all of the major accessibility initiatives underway. <clears throat> if you want to check that out, you can go to mbta.com slash accessibility hyphen initiatives. Uh, just to name a couple of the highlights, we currently have over 30 station projects Currently, there are over 30 stations slated for major accessibility upgrades, either actively under design or in construction. Uh, I think one of the biggest directly related to the settlement agreement is the fact that the first ever fully accessible connection between the red and orange lines at Downtown Crossing, those elevators and that mega project will be getting started uh, within the next year. So there's definitely a lot in that report as well as on our general website that we would encourage you to check out. As always, I like to remind everyone that if at any point you have any questions or you've experienced subpar service for any reason, we really want to hear about it. Uh, and you can let us know by calling our main Outline at 617-222-3200 or going to mbta.com and clicking on support and filling out a feedback form or simply tweeting, tweeting at us. Is it still called tweeting? Xing us at mbta, at mbta. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Also just want to put a plug in uh, next Thursday. As the judgment and the uh, RTAG is hosting a listening session specifically on snow and ice removal child challenges. So we'd encourage everyone to join them then to share feedback. That's virtual from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, and I know we have a few of you who really like to plan ahead. We have the next settlement update meeting uh, already on the books for June 26, 2024. Uh, stay tuned for that agenda. Um, but but that is on the books and we look forward to, to seeing you then, but, but hopefully before. All right, next slide. All right, and now I am extremely pleased to have the opportunity to introduce uh, Ryan Koholin, who has just accepted the uh, role of uh, our Chief Operating Officer. My team and I have had the opportunity to work with Ryan for a number of years as he was overseeing the operations of our commuter rail network, uh, no small feats, and got to collaborate on a number of accessibility issues and are very much looking forward to continuing that, that uh, relationship and our work together. All right, turning it over to you. Thanks so much, Laura. And uh, uh, everyone, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. In my previous role, I've had the, had the opportunity to join you all in some of these meetings in the past, and I look forward to continuing that in my new role as Chief Operating Officer for the entire MBTA. Uh, as Laura said, I have 10 years with the with the MBTA, just a brief inter introduction. Uh, most of that as the Chief Railroad Officer, where I oversaw commuter rail operations, infrastructure, and equipment. Uh, but all, all, all in just about 30 years of rail transportation experience. Um, you know, as Laura mentioned, so in this new role, whether it's rail transportation, light rail, heavy rail, 
bus, commuter rail, ferry, uh, the ride service, and all of the supporting departments needed to deliver those services uh, rolls up to me. I do want to recognize I'm joined by my chief of staff, Deidre Habeshaw, here tonight as well. Um, and uh, I was asked to talk about a fun fact. And, uh, you know, my, my style and my approach is very hands-on. And uh, um, I think one of the funnest facts is uh, it's not uncommon to see me out on the system, uh, even operating my own train uh, as I commute to and from uh, the downtown Boston area. I keep my engineer's uh, certification active. I stay qualified on the lines. And I found that that's really the best way to understand what is going on out on the system. Uh, I like to be out and about. Uh, the general manager can attest to this. I'm not a fan of uh, meetings. Uh, they are necessary though, but uh, my passion is to be out and connecting with all of our passengers and really all of our stakeholders. And certainly uh, I've enjoyed the relationship uh, internal with SWA and certainly enjoyed working with, uh, with the entire community to make the MBTA uh, everything it should be and more. Next slide, please. So certainly, and, and I do recognize that there is a lot of work still to do, um, but I am able to speak to some of the progress that I've seen during my tenure with the MBTA. Um, and I do want to recognize some of the progress that has been made. Uh, you know, recently, you know, an entirely low floor bus fleet. I think that is, uh, that's a milestone with where I've seen the MBTA be historically in the direction it's heading in the future. Uh, but that's something I'm very proud of. Um, we have certainly improved how we message in stations. Uh, every time I go out, I find another uh, electronic display. Um, you know, I see speakers being replaced. And believe me, I, I do know that there is a lot more work to do, but we're never going to stop. We will not stop improving uh, accessibility to all of our services. I think one thing, and Laura talked to this, I've worked with Laura in the SWA group here for uh, well, just about 10 years. And, uh, you know, I think that having that existing relationship, understanding what some of those challenges have been historically, will help us really make progress in the coming years to improve uh, accessibility here at the MBTA. And, you know, certainly with everything going on at the MBTA, there's a big focus on hiring and bringing in new faces and new operators, regardless of the mode. And I think that as we bring in uh, new faces, maybe new to the industry or certainly new to the MBTA, it's important that when we train our frontline employees, we need to recognize that this may be different for them, new for them, and how we operate our services um, and how we handle things like ramps, uh, how to mitigate those platform gaps that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, you know, that's a big part of, uh, of where I come from. Training is critical, good training and evolving training. Training is never done. Once you've been quote unquote trained, it doesn't end there. It has to evolve. As our technology evolves, as our vehicles evolve, our training needs to keep up with that. And then Laura talked a little bit, but certainly, you know, we have 30 stations in the pipeline, uh, which will see major accessibility improvements over the coming years. And I, uh, I couldn't be happier with that. And I'll say it again, there is still a lot more work to do, uh, but, but we are on it. We're aware and we are committed to it. Next slide, please. So uh, I, I've heard a lot of comments about elevator uptime and, you know, statistics, when I think about elevator statistics, um, you know, reporting on the system holistically, um, you know, uh, I think that, you know, the, the, uh, the value represented here between 2008 and 2021, 99.5%. That's great except for when you utilize the station that has that 0.5% downtime, right? And I think that it's important to look at specific locations rather than a all-in uptime value. And I think that that helps us better understand how elevator uh, downtime impacts the rider experience. Because if I touted that number, it doesn't tell the story of the one passenger who, uh, who has an issue with elevators, escalators, uh, even cleanliness at that one station that they rely on. So 
you know, my approach of being out in the field. Um, I think I can, I can help decipher, you know, statistics and, and decipher how they actually apply to the rider experience. I think that that's important. We are focused heavily on elevators and we have a lot of internal uh, improvement programs that we're rolling out, have rolled out or that we're refining to constantly improve the longer term performance of our elevator infrastructure. Uh, we do rely heavily on uh, contracted forces, you know, specialists that, that repair elevators, that certify elevators, um, you know, and they're not immune from the same struggles we have with uh, hiring and training and bandwidth. Uh, but nonetheless, as the MBTA, um, I'm looking to work closely with Dennis Varley um, and the facilities team to to really strengthen those relationships with the contractors that we rely on. We need to, uh, you know, have very regular and very clear dialogue with them to set our expectations so that, again, our passengers can can get the, the biggest benefit. Um, you know, we have done a lot of work to, to find correlation between failures. And it's very easy when you look at the MBTA to say, well, you know, this is the oldest elevator. Let's start here. But we found, though, that there's, not necessarily a direct correlation between downtime and elevator age. You know, I think there's a lot of factors that play into elevators and escalators, environmental factors, moisture, temperature swings. You know, in the in the railroad world where I come from, we're very sensitive to temperature swings because metal and steel and those components, they expand and contract and they get weak and uh, like anything else, if you take a paper clip and bend it so many times, eventually it's going to break. So, and I think that that's an important part, as uh, as the general manager described earlier, the collaboration across different parts of the of the agency. You know, with Sam Zhao in designing or or developing our standards, right, so that an asset like an elevator or an escalator becomes easy to maintain, right? Working with Dennis Varley and the facilities group. To, to really make sure that uh, we are out there observing, maintaining. And again, I think that contractor relationship is so vital for us to build and we look forward to building that moving forward. And of course, we do have our, our in-house staff who is very familiar uh, with, those, uh, with those apparatus. The Office of the Chief Engineer continues to work on identifying what we call the top five. And we really wanna prioritize efforts to repair those repeat offenders if you're on the top five list, it's not, not the best place to be. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think we went too far. There we go. So platform gaps, subway stations, I've heard a lot of talk, and certainly with all of the new vehicles that we have coming online, you know, the Orange Line operates now with 100% of the new uh, subway cars, red line, we're starting to see more and more come into service. And we'll continue to see more on the orange line as as uh, as the coming months um, come, come into play. Platform gaps, you know, I think that, so I've had a lot of experience with vehicle acceptance here at the MBTA. And one thing, and I'm working very closely with the vehicle engineering folks uh, and the mechanical teams, one thing that we did on commuter rail that we saw a lot of success with was we gave uh, we gave the OEM uh, a dedicated track to commission uh, coaches on. And this is important because as you set level, right, um, you can dial in plus or minus, you know, half an inch, an inch to where that platform height needs to be. Uh, you know, these vehicles have spring suspension systems, airbags, and you know, I don't subscribe to just put it into service and we'll make the adjustments as needed. I would like to get to the point where most of that pre-delivery or that uh, that pre-revenue inspection details our platform interactions with those vehicles so that we can address them before they go into service. Um, so we're doing a lot of work on that to address those issues on the new vehicles when they actually arrive here, not when they're out into service. Um, and, you know, one thing I do want to highlight with the recently released track improvement plan, we have an awful lot of work. We have work that we have completed and we have a lot of work on the horizon throughout the entire 2024 year. Um, but as we've worked through that plan, 
it's important to recognize the work that we're doing on our tracks. Uh, they have the potential to change how vehicles and platforms interact. Uh, our QC process, we've expanded that to focus specifically on platform interaction with vehicles to make sure that there are no surprises when those first trains uh, go through a station and we have a platform gap that we cannot overcome. Uh, so I hear you loud and clear. And I think that we have a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of back to basic approaches that are going to show our careful and planned commitments to how we fix the tracks, how we introduce new vehicles to the system, ultimately to provide the best passenger experience we can. Uh, next slide, please. We've talked a lot about third party shuttles tonight, and, uh, you know, I think that my goal, right, I believe in true ownership. And I think that we've seen with the recent track uh, improvement projects, recent surges, that we've been able to uh, mix in MBTA fleets using MBTA operators. And we've had tremendous success. I think back to the work on the Ashmont line, uh, where every weekend those those shuttles were operated 100% by MBTA in-house sources. And that was a very proud moment. Because as we continue to deliver on our commitments to the ridership with improving the track, improving the ride, um, we're continuing to build that pride in ownership. And the more that we can utilize our own in-house uh, operators, our own vehicles, that is the direction that, that I'm focused on going. There are some diversions that we have to rely on third-party buses, sometimes it's just the volume we need. Um, but we hear you loud and clear about the issues. I've seen them. Uh, you know, I think that as we increase third party bus operators, our oversight, um, to those operators and also the protocols for what they have to provide as far as not just a vehicle, but how their operators are trained. Uh, I think that we need to pay very close attention to make sure that it's, it's, it's effective. I use the word effective a lot because, I could say uh, cost effective or service effective, but really effective covers all the bases. Again, to ensure that we have ownership in your rider experience. Um, you know, and I think that as we rely on third parties, we run the risk of having high floor traditional coach style buses. Um, you know, but our contracts are specific. Uh, we are working to hold our contractors accountable. And Judge King actually made mention earlier, the more that we hear, the more feedback we get, the more action we can take to hold contractors accountable. Uh, and and uh, this, this leadership team under, under uh, the general manager is all about accountability, which is a two-way street. So um, again, the more that we get feedback, and we'll take it, good, bad, or indifferent, we want the feedback. We rely on the eyes of all, all of our stakeholders for constant improvement. Then I think with the 2024 plan, this is the first time I've been uh, with the MBTA and able to say in June of uh, you know 2024, uh, or even two or three months from now, this is the work that we have planned. I think that as we actively talk about diversions further in advance, it allows everyone to better prepare, including us. It allows us to work with those third party vendors to make sure that they're bringing the right fleet here to Boston and that their operators are providing the right service. Uh, next slide, please. And then obviously on vehicle communications, um, you know, we talk an awful lot about better ways to get information out to the ridership during their ride. You know, there's, there's phases during the journey. There's, there's the time frame leading up to the trip where you're planning. There's the time when you're actually taking your trip and then the time after your trip, um, you know, but it's that time where we have you as, an, as a captive audience. Uh, we need to look at what systems we can deploy to give you the best real time information, uh, you know, audibly and visually. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the new subway cars on the red and orange line, they do have onboard visual displays um, and they do have a robust audio system. The next is to continue the work that we are doing with CRRC to look at those interfaces and get to a place where we can better communicate with a vehicle in real time to talk about things like elevator outages, service interruptions, 
and certainly for the worst case, to provide information in the case of an emergency, both audibly and visually. Um, you know, I've had a lot of success on the commuter rail with, uh, with mixed fleets and trying to get all of those systems to work together. I will tell you it's not easy. As someone who struggles sometimes to get their cell phone to work, it's not easy. Uh, but I think that this team has the experience. and We certainly have the commitment to uh, fix our live communication on board our vehicles. Next slide, please. And I think that that concludes my points. But again, I, I really can't thank you all enough for having me here tonight. And I look forward to continuing to work certainly with the SWA folks and look forward to getting to uh, get to know all of you here. Thank you so much. Ryan, thank you so much. Um, all right, and last but not least, before we get to our feedback session, I want to introduce Angel Dunahue Rodriguez. Angel serves as the Assistant General Manager for External Affairs, and he is going to share some information about the development of a municipal communication and coordination plan. Angel? Thanks, Laura. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is one of, uh, uh, I've been to several meetings in my past roles here at the T. I'd be remiss if I did not uh, acknowledge uh, one of my colleagues on my team, Ashley Armand, who many of you might already know, uh, who handles uh, our community engagement at the organization. Uh, very appreciative for all the hard work that her and her team constantly do. So I just want to make sure I acknowledge that. And for all my other colleagues at the T that, that put in all all, all, all sorts of work um, at all hours of the night to make the system move um, as efficiently and, and as accessible as possible. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, we, we serve 176 cities and towns, 51 of which um, uh, provide or are provided by bus service. And we hear all sorts of um, uh, communications from all of them. One of the areas of the growth within our organization that, uh, that we certainly learned last year and lessons learned around the Orange Line closure is we needed better, better communications with our municipalities. And we really made an effort to be able to do that. So under the general manager's leadership, we created my position of assistant general manager for external affairs. Um, and within that team, uh, we have a couple of different functions. As I mentioned earlier, we have community engagement. The other piece is government affairs. Um, and we are in the midst of hiring a director of government affairs that will oversee two individuals. And this, this person is really going to be the lead person that's going to be uh, ensuring that we uh, are having effective communications with municipalities um, so that we're able to, 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 to deal with needs as they arise as quickly as possible. Um, and so uh, one of the things we did last year after the Orange Line closure is we began our first uh, meeting that we've ever held uh, where we walked over how to clean um, uh, our bus stops uh, in key locations uh, for the MBT and kind of the, the responsibilities that we have and the responsibilities that municipalities have. Next slides. And the development of that plan, um, uh, we've been working diligently within our office here at the GM's office, uh, SWA, operations and planning, the police department, obviously, the policy department, uh, engineering and maintenance, and commercial strategies. Um, and we've identified uh, one of the big needs is we need someone that's fully dedicated to be able to execute and maintain this this engagement plan with municipalities. Next slide, please. So the create we've created that position, uh, and that position will be a director of government affairs. That does not mean that in the future, as we're going through our budgets, doesn't mean that we can add additional support where it is needed. Um, and so this person is going to be maintaining a centralized database. We already begun that work on key uh, municipal uh, contacts and regular meetings with them. Um, we are going to be disseminating regular uh, materials to municipalities around our operations, particularly around diversions. Um, we've made a very con uh, uh, concentrated effort, uh, thanks to some of the work that Ashley and her team have done, to make sure that we are coordinating with not just municipalities, but also with community organizations and, and, organ and, and other advocates, uh, such as yourselves, around some of the work that we are doing um, during these closures. Uh, and then one of the things that this individual also do is create a website uh, where municipalities will be able to go in and find out 
uh, some of our kind of rules of the road, if you will, uh, around uh, uh, maintenance and cleaning uh, that happens within our system uh, to make our system more accessible. Next slide. Um, I wanted to show this um, this particular slide. Uh, it's a, as I mentioned earlier, it's a pretty big thing that we did last year for the first time where we talked about what the responsibilities are uh, between municipalities and the MBTA for cleaning key bus stops um, and bus stops that are outside of our net that that are further out in our network. Uh, and if you if you can see here um, this in this rendering, we showed this to municipalities last week uh, in our yearly meeting. Uh, where we clearly delineated what our um, expectations were um, around these around uh, cleaning these bus stops. And uh, we've gotten a great response. Um, we had about 60 or odd different municipalities that showed up. Uh, we didn't just cover um, buses uh, and bus stops. But we did cover kind of uh, uh, we covered salting um, and how that would work, particularly as it relates to some of the safety upgrades that were recently made at our 240-odd uh, railroad crossing. So we it was a pretty comprehensive hearing, um, and we've continuously have heard feedback from municipalities that they appreciate the new engagement that we've been having with them. Um, so uh, we are we enforce with them the importance of making sure that uh, enforcement of those bus stop laws happen within those municipalities. Uh, and if there are any concerns, uh, they understand who they need to contact now from my team uh, going forward so that if any issues arise, we're able to tackle them as quickly as possible. Next slide. And I think that covers my end. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for being here. And, and it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. And again, thank you for all your hard work and we really appreciate it. Laura? Angel, thank you so much. Oh, again, I just want to note, Angel and I are looking forward to uh, getting together with the plaintiffs and our tag board at some point in January to get their feedback on this draft plan, which we're hoping will make a difference on a number of the issues that folks raised earlier tonight. All right, at this point, I'm going to ask my colleague Ashley Armand to join me to help uh, Judge King and myself facilitate the feedback and Q&A portion of the meeting. Uh, Ashley, if you're ready, if you could uh, walk folks through how this is going to work. Yes, thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. I'm Ashley Armand, and I'm the Deputy Director of Community Engagement at the T. As we move into the Q&A, if you'd like to share a comment or ask a question for the judge and members of the system-wide accessibility team, you can use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your type question or comment on the chat directly. People who wish to share a comment verbally, which I see some folks here are already doing, you can raise your hand and use the raise hand button. As you may all be aware, all the participants in this meeting have been muted upon entry so that you all will be able to hear the uh, present presenters. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand. I'll ask you to unmute so that you can state your question or comment. And I'd also like to note that we'll alternate between reading questions and comments that have already been submitted. We've been taking in all of your comments and questions that you've been sending throughout the chat in a tracker so that we can state them out loud. So please feel free to continue doing that in the chat. And then also, if we are unmuting you, we ask that you can be brief, but also speak as slowly as you can so that our interpreters can also interpret what you're sharing and so that we can get to as many people as possible. If you're joining by the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing the star and then the nine button. And all the attendees who speak Spanish currently in the room, you can also raise your hand as well and your interpreter will state your question or comment verbally to us here. And then we'll repeat, we'll repeat your comment or question and then provide you with the answer as well. Before we open the comment and question segment to the public, we'd like to invite any elected officials in attendance or their staff to ask questions or make comments. And you can also use a raise hand feature so that we can recognize and unmute you. So I'm not gonna take this time to scan the room and also see if any folks are raising their hand so that we can um, get your comment or question. Okay, so it looks like there isn't anyone in the room for that. So we'll now open it up to the general public. I'll start off with Tom 
I'm asking you to unmute yourself now. Hi, um, I, I, I have a question in, in regards to uh, 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 what uh, the discussion that Angel is having on uh, on on uh, municipal coordination. Um, I, I really want to I, I really want to bring bring up a concern that I have about how how they're uh, re re augmenting the bus stops. You know, as far as um, uh, as far as far as putting bus stops that don't line up with the with the inbound to the outbound, meaning that, for example, there's a bus stop in Somerville at Illinois Street, and and and, and then there's another bus stop uh, at at Glen Street in Broadway. Uh, Illinois would be the outbound. Uh, Glen Street would be the inbound. Now they did they 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 did uh, change Glen Street for the better because it's now because now it's a far side stop and that's all good and everything. But then what they did, they made they make you walk up a block to 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 get to the Illinois one, and this is supposed to be about mass transit, not mass confusion. He's supposed to be able to know that that you you you'll be able to cross at an audible, uh, vibratable traffic light crossover and and have the bus stop from the from the outbound or from the outbound to the inbound, and that and that's a concern that 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 I wanted to bring up that's been caused by the. Uh, the uh, the better bus uh, bus uh, thing has been going on, and that they're basically fixing something that that in some ways isn't broken. I was wondering if someone could respond to that. I'm happy to respond to that, uh, Angel, unless you want it. Uh, I I have to admit I'm not familiar with that stop, um, but I can I can go ahead and try and talk to some of the folks over at Bus Network Redesign and. And uh, we can certainly uh, reply back uh, with an answer on that. But I don't know if you want to go ahead and if there, if there are any other details, Ryan, that you may have that I don't. Sure. No, I think the comment's very fair. You know, I think that uh, sometimes it makes no sense to have to travel several blocks one direction to catch a bus in the opposite direction. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm immersing myself a little bit this week in bus network redesign. And I think that that's a very fair comment that I want to take back to them. And uh, make sure that we're not replicating what might not be the best practice. I want to make sure that bus network redesign is truly that. It has to be a redesign, but, but for the better. So uh, point very well taken, and I, I appreciate that feedback. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. We've gotten that uh, feedback, and I have your contact information already, so I'll be sure to give you a response once I get once I get it for you. Okay. It's nice to see you again, by the way. Any other hands? Esther. Okay. I mention this a lot, and Laura knows it, but I'm glad that there's someone here other than Laura that hopefully can answer this question for me, especially the gentleman that said that he dealt with the commuter rail. My pet peeve with the commuter rail at North Station, South Station, any of the your, your uh, stations, but mainly North Station. I'm a person with low vision. I was declared legally blind earlier this year. My major pet peeve with your commuter rail station is that if all of those trains are on that on their tracks. It could be rain, snow, sleet, sun, whatever. Why is it that those platforms are not lit so that people like me don't have to ask a conductor or whoever works on the train to help me down the track for fear that I may fall off or into in between the cars or onto the track because it's happened at least three times. The only lighting in the in, in North Station is right when you come out of the TD Garden. I won't even discuss Back Bay, Davis Square, or um, what is it? Uh, one second. It's uh, South Station, North, Back Bay Station. Forest Hill Station, Porter and Davis Square, those train stations are entirely 
too dark. And if someone like me who's in a wheelchair, who's already fallen down a flight of steps while strapped in it, mind you, what are you going to do about bettering the lighting in these stations? Because I've even had people that have vision better than mine tell me that those stations are way too dark for them. This has to change really soon. Esther, I am definitely going to give Ryan a chance to respond to this one, or if Dennis, our chief of stations, is still on. But I did, before I turn it over to them, I wanted to ask you, based on feedback you provided a while back, the team at QLIS went out over the last two months to do an audit of the North Station platforms and reported a number of light bulbs that were out, were, were out, burnt out, and replaced a significant number. I don't know if you've been back within the last month, but we understand that the lighting conditions to be much improved there. So if you haven't, please let us know what you think about that location. Um, but let me turn it over to either Ryan or Dennis to sort of speak to lighting in general. Sure. I, yeah, I, I can comment on that. I think that uh, I think you, you, your concern is definitely heard. I do know uh, that there has been a lot of work done, uh, particularly at North and South Station with lighting. And I think South Station in particular, if you have traveled through there in the last 30 days or so, uh, you'll see uh, as you walk out of the, the, the head house or travel out of the head house, um, the center of the of the platform area has a much brighter uh, LED type type light, and that's being done in uh, coordination with the Heinz Overbuild project. But I think if you're able to see what is happening there, that will be very indicative of what the final condition is going to look like. Because just that one uh, that one platform with that lighting has dramatically changed the atmosphere in, inside South Station. Uh, on the actual platform. So um, look forward to that, definitely. Um, and I think that, I mean, quite frankly, the, the, the rapport and relationship that I have with Dennis Varley, um, you know, it's, it's nothing for us to, to say, what are you doing? Let's go take a ride. So I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to invite Dennis if he's not on this call. But uh, Dennis, I think we're going to take a ride to Davis Square and Forest Hills and Porter. And let's see what what improvements we can make if we have to swap a light bulb over uh, to LED or, or, or different or a different output. I think that we're we're very happy to to look into that. Absolutely. Again, as I said earlier, my best feedback is seeing it with my own eyes. My second best is certainly going to be uh, folks like you that raise these concerns. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Laura. The next question that we have was brought up in the chat and it says, how wide are street markings for bus stops supposed to be? At the three line mega stop on Washington at Walnut in Brookline Village, bus drivers say they can't pull up to the curb because the stop is marked too narrow, such that when vehicles are in an adjacent lane, the bus can't fit. I measured the width of the space from the outside edges, most generous technique, it's seven foot seven inches. Uh, do we have anybody from our service planning team here who can speak to that? If so, can you raise your hand, Melissa? I see you. Can we unmute Melissa Delay, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, super. Uh, my name is Melissa Dulay. I'm the Senior Director of Service Planning. When we're looking at designing either bus lanes or uh, bus, um, bus parking lanes or bus travel lanes, for a bus parking lane, if it's where the bus stop is located, where we would have the ability to, you know, have the mirror overhang the, the curb slightly, uh, we typically design that to be 10 feet wide. And for a travel lane, we are looking for lanes to be 11 feet wide. So uh, if there is something that is 7.7, .7, I would absolutely agree uh, with the uh, bus operators uh, characterization of that as too narrow. And uh, I'm taking down these notes so that we can coordinate with uh, the, the projects here. I know we have some projects 
or sometimes uh, municipalities also have projects uh, on some of the roads where we operate. So I, I'm not familiar with the specific details of that case, but those are the dimensions we'd be looking for. Thank you, Melissa. An affirmation that we received is that the Access in Motion campaign catches writers' attention and is attractive, good humored, and attention and and intelligent. So thank you, System Wide Accessibility, for creating a campaign that is attractive, good humored, and intelligent. We're now going back to the hand raise. One moment. I'm now unmuting you, Ali. Hi, everyone. My name is Ali. Thank you so much for doing this and inviting the public to be a part of this and hearing the voices. It's very appreciated. Um, I myself navigate life with disability. I live in Franklin, and I also serve on the Franklin Disability Commission. Uh, we have two commuter rail stops in Franklin. We have the Forge Park stop and the Dean college stop or just the Dean stop. The Forge Park stop is considered accessible, though I have not actually visited that one personally. Um, however, the downtown stop, the Dean Franklin Station, is not accessible. Um, anytime this has been brought up and questioned, the response that myself and other members of the Disability Commission have received is that Franklin has another stop. So it's, it has not been even listed on any sort of projects or anything because of Franklin having two stops. However, Franklin is a large town and just because one station is considered accessible, we don't feel like it's fair that the other one is not, nor has it been considered for any type of projects, particularly because the Dean stop is located in downtown Franklin where, where tons of housing is. We have a lot of individuals in town who use the housing, the college, and navigate life with disability. I can't tell you how many people, myself included, you see cruising around our downtown with mobility scooters in particular. But unfortunately, those individuals are not able to access the commuter rail. And they're often, unfortunately, told you're just going to have to go to Forge Park, which feels really demeaning. Um, in fact, I visited a few weeks ago, or actually like a month ago at this point, and one of the individuals that was helping get passengers on the train said, oh, you're just going to have to go to the other station. I don't drive. A lot of other people that navigate life with disability also don't drive. So it's actually also not accessible for us to go to Forge Park. Therefore, we have sent a few letters to MPTA. To my knowledge, we have not heard back. When I say we, I mean the Franklin Disability Commission. And we would very much appreciate the Franklin Dean Station to be added to some sort of project list for making it accessible where individuals with wheelchairs or other mobility aids can get on the commuter rail and also consideration for the handicapped parking spots that are there to have aisle stripes added because those are also not fully accessible handicapped parking spots. I'm curious if this already is being considered as a project or not, maybe where that stands. But either way, thank you for hearing my voice on that. Um, Ali, I am actually very excited to have the opportunity to respond to this. Um, first, I did want to say we did, we did through the GM's office receive a letter from the chair of the Disability Commission. I responded to her email address that I found online, but I'm guessing that is either not active or not one that is regularly checked. So if you um, could send me a direct message in the chat, if there's a good email address to use, that would be great. Otherwise, I will drop that in the old fashioned uh, mailbox later this week. But um, in the response, I shared the fact that, one, we completely agree. Uh, it is not good enough to have one accessible station in a town like Franklin. Um, it is our goal as an agency to make sure that all of our stops along our subway and commuter rail network are accessible. That is a significant challenge for a number of reasons. We have 26 inaccessible stations in our commuter rail network, including Franklin. 
and the average price of making a station fully accessible is between 60 and $80 million. That having been said, we are very optimistic that we have found a creative way to provide meaningful accessibility at roughly half of those stations uh, in a relatively quick amount of time. Specifically, we've been working over the last year and a half to develop what we're calling a freestanding mini high-level platform. So essentially a platform that is uh, all long enough to serve two cars of the train and provide level boarding to those cars. Uh, but that does not require deep alterations into the underlying platform. Because for those regula regulatory geeks in the audience, when you alter a station platform, it triggers the obligation to construct a full high, fully compliant station, which leads to the $60 million, $80 million price tag. And although that is absolutely in our medium to long-term plans, we know riders don't want to wait for that. So actually Franklin is part of four stations, including Wellesley Square, West Medford, and Walpole, where we're gonna be piloting these freestanding platforms. We have design teams out there checking out the stations now to identify what other minor upgrades might be, made it, might be needed to make them usable. And we're hoping to have that work done um, uh, relatively early in 2024, hopefully by, this, by the summer. Um, this is one of those projects that you can read a little bit about in our initiatives report. Um, and at any point, uh, we would be happy to come and talk to the Franklin Disability Commission more if that's that's of interest. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that response. I provided my email for you. I'm actually the one that wrote the letter for the commission. So you can definitely reach out to me. We have a meeting tomorrow. So I'd be happy to share Perfect. everything with them. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks. Thank you. We're now going to Colleen Flanagan. Thank you, um, and good to see everybody. Thank you, Laura, everybody. I just have a really quick comment because I appreciated uh, a whole slide dedicated to the platform gaps. I personally experienced the platform gaps at Green Street, and I agree with you. They are coming in very high. I use a power wheelchair to commute from Green Street to Haymarket when it's open, if not State Street, most weekdays for work. and because of the gap problem that we have right now, dependent on a gap mitigation system. I don't think that it's fair that the burden, there's such a burden now on disabled riders that wasn't there when we didn't have this humongous gap to find an ambassador or find a solution to access the train. I appreciate that you said we, we need to do more work on this. I, I just wanted to comment that I hope you understand the urgency because I have personally missed trains trying to find a way for someone to either deploy the manual bridge gap or the automated gap mitigation system. So thank you, RTAG, for all you're doing, and I look forward to working with you more on this. Thanks, Colleen. And just to follow up on that, uh, we are expecting the uh, uh, comprehensive update on the audit that was done in the orange line about a month ago. And with that data in hand, we will understand what, what changes may be possible and how quickly they can be implemented. Thank you for that, Lauren, Colleen. The next commenter we have is Joanne. I've asked you to unmute, Joanne. Hi. Um, I'm, I wanted to speak about the, the commuter rail station, the South Station in particular, uh, because of Red Line and Orange Line, um, because of diversions, I've ended up having to use uh, commuter rail quite frequently in the last three or four months. Um, and I did notice the uh, improvement in the light uh, in South Station. However, 
the platforms themselves uh, are in, in, they're really in hard, poor condition. Uh, there are quite a few divots in the concrete. It would be easy for somebody who's just walking along to turn a heel. Um, and before the the lights light was improved in the center in the center um, tracks, that was something that frequently happened. People would would stumble um, on in these things. I use a wheelchair. It's painful to go through some of the uh, some of the holes in the platform. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, oh well, orange line too. Uh, I've had problems with the, the buttons with which on, on the new trains, uh, you push to, to get assistance. Uh, just, I, I have a video that I'm gonna send to Jennifer, um, but uh, this last Saturday, I was at uh, Forest Tail Station. The, uh, someone was supposed to have called ahead from downtown crossing to have somebody meet me. Uh, with a bridge plate, that didn't happen. I pressed the button to get assistance, nobody came. I had to start yelling for somebody to bring, bring a bridge plate and somebody in the other track, the train that was ready to pull out heard me and sent somebody over. But this is, this kind of thing happens. And uh, you know, this button is it says to wait for a, a steady light and never, no steady light ever happened. So this didn't go anywhere. I have a video of it. But I didn't get the assistance I needed at Forest Hills on Saturday. Um, that's it. That's those are my two. Thank you. All right. And Joanne, did you say you you've you already notified about that, or is that? Are those... no, I I took a, I took I was kind of prepared. I, I was busy between having to go to the hospital and get labs oh, yeah. done and go getting ready for this meeting. I just, I have a video that I'm gonna to send to Jennifer. I'll do that tonight. Don't don't worry about it again. Don't do anything with it till tomorrow. All right, but, no, we'll, make, we'll make sure to follow up with you to get those details so we can. You know, this is not the first time I've tried to get assistance with those buttons and it just hasn't happened. All right, thanks, so. Okay. Thank you, Joanne. We'll now pass this over. Tom, is this an old hand or a new hand? Let me know in the chat. Until then, I will unmute Rob Caruso. Okay, can you hear me now? Guess not. Yes, we can. Oop, Rob, it looks like you've gotten back to being muted. How's that? Good. Okay. Uh, my question has to do specifically about the three commuter rail stations in Newton, which have been a, a real problem uh, for a long, long time. And uh, the last time that we had had an update from the MBTA, a physical update uh, held at the, uh, uh, at, the, at the Newton Public Library was well over a year or a year and a half ago. And at that time, money was still being sought for uh, further uh, development, uh, further uh, um, uh, uh, planning for, for construction. I have since spoken with uh, Jake Auschenklaus, the uh, federal representative, our representative in Congress, that has informed uh, the people in Newton that that money has been allocated and has only yet have to be um, accessed by the state or, or MassDOT or the MBTA, whatever uh, uh, branches is, is uh, uh, available for that. And we've heard nothing for quite a long time. So I wanna know what the status of, of the situation is. We've had this problem going on in Newton now for a very long time. And uh, we have three stations and, and none of them are accessible. Rob, um, I can tell you that the design team within our engineering division uh, over the last year have continued to advance the design for all three stations. It's currently at what we refer to as the 75 
percent milestone. Um, that having been said, the new in commuter rail stations has, has proven to be a significant challenge in terms of our confidence to advance the project specifically due to the cost of the projects. Um, right now, the cost estimate is over $250 million to make the stations accessible. Uh, with that in mind, we have been looking for every opportunity to secure funding in addition to any state allocations that have been or will be made. Uh, this includes uh, applying for a new federal accessibility grants, which unfortunately we did not receive for the new ones last year, but we are likely going to be applying again this year. Uh, and another, a number of other opportunities. So really right now, conversations have been focusing on what are options for advancing this project um, given, given the costs. So uh, we can certainly relate to the project team that the community would like, would like an update, but I, we, I can tell you here, that's essentially where we are, we are at this moment. Thank you for that, Laura. Another okay. comment you received is, I noticed an accessibility improvement on at least one of the otherwise awkward coach buses that served mm -hmm. the green line diversion that mm -hmm. ended on December 5th. The seats near the chairlift were roped off so that if anyone boarded that way, the driver wouldn't have to reseat passengers. So that's just a comment that we've also received. Um, another question from the chat. Let's see. Esther, I've now unmuted you. Esther? Okay, we'll skip Esther for now. We'll come back, I Esther. I got it. Oh, perfect. Okay, back to the station gaps. I was just in Boston last week. As a matter of fact, last Thursday, I do believe it was. Um, I did see the, uh, the, the, the shuttle buses that were used for the Green Line because I when I got off the, the commuter rail from Lowell, which still has a rotten platform, mind you, um, the, they were saying that the Green Line was inoperative from North Station to the other branches of the Green Line, which I thought was kind of weird because I ended, I needed to go to Copley. Thank goodness I do, I, since having been born and raised in Boston, I did know that I could hop on the Orange Line and go to Back Bay. Here's my problem with this. And I hope that someone in upper management takes, takes this seriously. When you took that second trainman out of those cars, you put too much pressure on the driver. And I'll tell you why. I tried to get on the train at Back Bay and could not get on because the gap was too wide and my wheel, my front wheelchair wheels got stuck between the track and the, tr no, the, the, the platform and the train. The, 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 car, the trainman had to get from, walk from all the way up front to find a bridge plate to help me on near the back of the train walk back with the bridge plate and then get back in and drive the train. That would not have had to happen had that second trainman been there. They, the second one could have gotten out, taken care of me, train would have moved, would not have been, had any delay. My other um, thing is, is that, um, oh goodness, what, whenever, um, I have had issues with some of those buttons as well. When you push and you try to get someone to help and you can't. But my other question is, I was told when I was working with you all in system-wide that those new trains would have a button every third, on the first train, 
the third train and the last train for the bridge plate to come out. I mentioned that to one of the drivers and they said, oh no, it's not like that. The button for the car is inside and it's only for the driver to push. So you have to be at the first car in order to have access to that bridge plate. I'd like to know what is really the truth when it comes to that. Um, I can speak to the second the second question there about the the uh, the uh, gap mitigation device or what we're now calling the gap filler. So Esther, you are correct. A number of years ago, um, when the train specifications were first being developed, the intention absolutely was to have these gap mitigation devices available on every other car. So the first, third, and fifth. Um, and to have it be the case where customer would press the button. Uh, it was always the intention that the motor person would ultimately deploy it from their seat, but that they would simply press the button and the motor person would deploy. Um, as the design advanced, uh, and right before the new train cars arrived and as they were arriving, the pilot cars, a review was conducted by our safety department at the time. And they flagged some serious concerns about having essentially bridge plates deploy in locations of the train that were quite far away from the motor person. And the main safety concern was that here you essentially have a, a device sticking out from the bottom of the train, right as people may be stepping on it or off the train. And that that device may create a tripping hazard and or the motor person may not have an adequate line of sight into crowds of people around that door to determine if it was safe to deploy. So the safety department strongly recommended that the bridge plate, the gap mitigation device be limited to the first car only. Uh, so that is currently the case today. Um, we, I also should mention our working with CRRC to try to uh, make some modifications to the user experience of the bridge plate. Because right now, I don't know if you've experienced, it's a little bit funky between when you press the button, what the announcement says, and when the doors open with the bridge plate. And so we're hoping to smooth that out. Um, but but the motor person you spoke to was correct right now that that device is only available on the first first car of our new train sets. Okay. Thank you for that, Laura. Um, we don't have any more hand raised besides, oh, it looks like you removed her hand raise. Okay. We don't have any more hand raised. So <laughs> at this time, oh, Tom, you're back. <laughs> okay, I'll unmute you. After Tom, um, we can hand it over to the judge and Laura for any final remarks. Hi, is this Tom, our uh, name plaintiff and our, our tech member, uh, executive member? Um, I, 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 uh, I, I just, just wanted to give uh, Ryan uh, uh, an update on, on the, on the, uh, the first question I had earlier. There's, an, there's another one of those done down towards Leechmere Station, where it's moved from Twin City Plaza to a floating stop downward, and I, I, that, that, I didn't think that was a very good move, and and to let everybody know that that. that, that a car had ran over that floating stop and 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 and, and flattened the bus stop sign, the pole. And it, it just doesn't seem like a very safe place for it. And I think they should move it back to Twin City Plaza because you can turn around on the other side to the outbound easier. Whereas back at at back at Twin City Plaza, thanks. Thanks, Tom. I I took a note of that as well, and I, I appreciate that context because lets me see the before and the after and. Kind of just kind of decide what makes the most sense. Maybe it was better before. 
Yeah, I, I think it was because um, what, 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 what I don't understand is that the definition of ADA stops is, 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 to, ha is to have a stop, either stop in front of a shopping center, a, a senior citizen complex, where I did check if there was maybe a senior citizen complex down there, but there isn't. So I couldn't make sense of why they would have moved it fr from the shopping center where it's ADA accessible down to a floating stop, which doesn't even have a senior citizen housing unit. So it, it absolutely makes no sense to me. You know, is what I'm trying to get at. Oh, Tom, I will just quickly say the proliferation of floating box islands is is um, a direct response to the prolifer proliferation of bike lanes that have been implemented by municipalities. And uh, if you remember uh, from Angel's presentation, this is one of the issues that we are really going to be actively talking more with municipalities about because um, it does drive changes that really impact our riders. Um, I mean, it, so, oh, for better or worse, I don't think floating by silence are going to go away. That having been said, we are actively working on developing new design standards to make sure that people can find them safely and Cross, cross that bike lane in as safe as manner as possible. So I 100% hear and feel the frustration there with that shift. But, but this, again, is a direct response to working to accommodate cyclists who um, are traveling through those through those bus routes. Right, right. But, but the point could I the... speak uh, to okay. this a little bit? To Laura, if I can jump in. Um, again, this is Melissa, uh, Senior Director of Service Planning. The specific stop, uh, the floating stop over by Lechmere by the Twin City Plaza, that was actually uh, relocated. Mass DOT was reconstructing uh, the area, so they were able oh. to put in an accessible stop, but they didn't have enough uh, real estate on the plaza side. Uh, because uh, there, there's a bridge and it's just a very constrained area. So the place where they had enough width to create an accessible stop was a little bit farther down, which I recognize is, is not ideal, especially when you might have folks coming with groceries. Uh, definitely folks uh, are, are more sensitive to walking distance, but that's where we were able to fit in an accessible stop. And there also is the interaction with the right turn lane entering uh, Twin City Plaza. So uh, I know there's some complications and also there was that uh, a motorist hit it. It's a bit of a confusing area right now. They're still doing construction, so it's not quite in the final uh, configuration. Uh, a lot of the improvements, the, it's a, what the traffic engineers call a, a, a road diet to narrow the roadway to try to get traffic speeds to not treat it so much like a, a, a high-speed highway, but more like a, a boulevard, an urban boulevard where you have you know, pedestrians and cyclists and other folks with um, lower traffic speed. So uh, once the construction is complete, hopefully the situation uh, will be improved. I, I, I just think that um, like, 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 you, like you were saying, Laura, that this is going to be something that's going to be looked at as far as the proliferation of this whole, whole it's good, you know, the work's not done on this yet, that it's still going to be looked at and, and discussed and, and I take and everything. Yeah. Because I, because if if you can see it yourself, Laura, I mean, I mean, it's I don't know. It's just I I, I just think if they if they could have just improved the uh, the stop at Twin City Plaza, and not even it put the floating stop there, there wouldn't have been that accident. And it's like fixing something that isn't broken in a sense. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. All right, Tom. All right. I'd like to. Uh, it's uh, now uh, past seven thirty, so I'd like to. Uh, I'm going to end the meeting now, and I want to thank you all very much for participating. I think it's been a very good meeting. And uh, I wish you all a happy holiday season. I look forward to uh, uh, meeting you again at our next uh, public uh, meeting, which will be on June 26th at the same time, 530, if I don't see you before then. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank Thanks. you, Judge. Thanks, everybody. Have a night. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.